Will all the Loyalist Primarchs return to 40k, even the dead ones? As I've said during our four park Primarch series, you either love them or you hate them. Whether it's Sanguinius' epic moments during the Heresy, wherein he struggles to come to terms with his unwanted figurehead status, or Rogaldorn's stoic nature, perhaps holding him back from the brink of full berserk mode, which I know I would love to see unleashed. This duality within the Emperor's son's personalities has no doubt provided us all with some really entertaining moments in battle, or even just jibes at each other during the Great Crusade and Heresy War. Either way, I know a lot of people would love to see them all returned, while there is a fairly numeral crowd who are fervently set against it. Let's dive into how each may actually return, depending upon the lore surrounding their disappearance, as well as how the plot has developed around those circumstances to perhaps support this return, unbeknownst to us, the fanbase. Obviously, Gilliman and the Lion won't be included in this list, and if I had to speak about them at this moment in time, specifically the Lion, I'm not sure I could resist the urge to take some shots at the Lion's forest walking ability, or the Risen, don't even get me started. Guys, regarding this video, we also need to keep in mind that a considerable amount of writing about the Primarchs, let alone the narrative where dates and disappearances are concerned, can be very contradictory. I personally do believe that the more major literary undertakings by Black Library, such as the Horus Heresy, Dark Imperium, or Black Legion books, are efforts to set storyline standards though. These novels are superlative to what we've had to go on previously, which is White Dwarf articles and codexes over the span of a few decades and many different writers. Before we get into Rogel Dawn and a take that I've not seen anywhere else, I want to let you know that just over 96% of our viewers within the last month aren't subscribed. Subscribing and hitting the notification bell is an excellent way to support us guys. The more subs and therefore views we gain provides us with the ability to invest in more advanced editing software, actual soundproofing for our recording area which would be amazing, and even a nice camera for filming. It's quite the list, but thank you all for the support so far. Rogel Dawn Noble son of Inwit and proud defender of humanity's homeworld, Rogel Dawn disappears, assumed dead, whilst again defending the Imperium from the ravenous hordes of the ruinous powers. From the articles and date drops in the more up-to-date novels we have so far, it does seem that at the time of his disappearance, Rogel Dawn was the last Loyalist Primarch standing. What an irony that the Praetorian who felt so alone and burdened during the defence of Terra, and who also blamed himself for the suffering humanity endured during that dark time, was the last surviving brother. That experience truly must have been harrowing for him. I wonder if we'll witness this during a series which details the events of the Scouring, the Imperium slowly grinding back the forces of the ruinous powers, and the opportunistic secessionists as the forces of traitor marines begrudgingly retreat into the Eye of Terror. Rogel has even been quite a polarising character within the fanbase, with some admiring his stoic nature and defence of the throne world, whilst others dislike him seemingly for the same reasons. What we see glimpses of during the Siege of Terror novels is a demigod brought low, one who was created with the intention of always existing a league above humanity whose mundane human qualities progressively are amplified, albeit under the strain of an enormous superhuman effort in defending the Imperial Palace. We witness a man who reflects ever more inwardly and comes to not only regret the events which have come to pass during the heresy and siege, but more so that even during his immense effort to hold back traitor forces from first the Segmentum Solar, then the palace itself, deeply feels for each life lost in the process. All of this while straining himself ever more thinly, beyond almost the limits of even a Primarch, in an effort to prevent a traitor victory. His disciplined, at times thunderous demeanour does not portray these inner feelings of inadequacy however, which may lead to some misjudging his character entirely. After the breaking of Horus armies during the infamous siege, the lore that does exist has been accumulated over decades of White Dwarfs and Codex entries, but we do know that there is at least the possibility he may yet live, and for a being as powerful and resilient as a Primarch, that small glimmer of hope is all they need. If the Lion can survive the breaking of a world, I'll tell you now, the most determined and indomitable Primarch of all is not going to let 
a little thing like a chaos incursion, send him to an early grave. Though, as I've mentioned, the circumstances of Rogel's disappearance are explored only shallowly. Personally, and this is just my opinion, I expect that the third Black Legion book by Dan Abnett will dive into the detail more thoroughly, considering that it is theorised he disappeared whilst fighting against Chaos during Abaddon's first, if not at least one of his early, Black Crusades. For those who are not aware, it is said the Praetorian died alongside members of his chapter whilst mounting a valiant defence against a fleet of Chaos warships in an effort to again defend the Imperium against the misbegotten traitorous hordes. In a last ditch effort to stop the warships of the ruinous powers from further violating Imperial worlds, Rogel Dawn and his fists conducted a series of boarding actions with the Primarch supposedly being laid low by hordes of enemies aboard the traitor vessel known as Sword of Sacrilege, before only the skeletal remains of his hand were recovered. All other traces of Dawn vanished. Now again, my opinion, and let me know your thoughts in the comments or the Discord. But after all this build up during the general heresy novels, but more so those within the Siege of Terror, to just kill off the Primarch responsible for the entire defense of the Soul System during a ship boarding action would be a complete injustice to the man. What an absolutely diabolical way to treat who is arguably the Primarch we spend the most time getting to know during the Heresy series. Without having any information available on the detailed plot leading up to Dawn's appearance, more or less owing to the fact a scouring series or third Black Legion novel haven't been released yet, it is difficult to say exactly how Rogel Dawn would escape this supposed death and why he may not have resurfaced in the last 9 to 10 millennia. I have three possibilities I'll share with you. Let me know your thoughts though, maybe you have a different take or other information which could even collaborate one of these. I'll leave the craziest one till last. Firstly, knowing the guilt Rogel is said to feel towards the loss of lives during the battles of the Horus Heresy, as well as his inability to intervene against Horus during the Emperor's fated duel with his corrupt son, we can suppose that Rogel may have taken an opportunity to flee the spotlight of the Imperium and eke out a quieter existence where he could make an impact as an individual in a galaxy of madness. We have seen other Primarchs such as Corvus Corax and Lehman Rust depart of their own volition, though not as secretly as this. It may be that Rogel's hand was severed during the fighting aboard the Sword of Sacrilege and conveniently left behind as evidence for his sons to find. Ask yourself, if the forces of Chaos did in fact kill a Primarch and retain his body, or even just parts of it, why have none of them publicly paraded these as trophies, or even mentioned it? It's very suspicious. Secondly, the Praetorian could be in stasis similar to the situation we saw Rebute in after his duel with Fulgrim millennia prior. During the Heresy series, we learn Conrad Kurz witnessed a vision which told of Rogel Dawn's demise, dragged down by many enemies in the dark. Could he have been overwhelmed in combat, but rescued on the brink of death by a third party, neither the fists or chaos involved? There are some options such as Cypher who, it was unveiled in the novel Cypher Lord of the Fallen recently, seems to be on an Emperor given quest to kill Big E himself, assumedly to revive him. Another is the Necron Overlord Trazin the Infinite. Trazin's obsessive want to collect specimens of various species throughout the galaxy especially unique ones who have made some kind of lasting impact upon history, is renowned within the fanbase. After all, he does possess Fulgrim's one and only clone thanks to Fabius Bile. It could be that Rogel Dawn was added to this collection before his ultimate demise, Trazin not willing to allow such an historically important and unique figure to perish. And lastly, could it be that Rogel Dawn will make an appearance in Dan Abnett's last novel, of his Beckwin trilogy. In the closing chapter of Penitent, released a couple years ago now, one of the major antagonists for the Beckwin, Eisenhorn and Rabina novel trilogies is the King in Yellow, a secretive figure that it would seem we are set to learn more about in the third book of the Beckwin series. Major spoiler for the latest novel in this series, so skip ahead a few seconds if you don't want to hear it. Inside a book which supposedly states the name of the King in Yellow, the only name present is Constantine Valdor. Now, Valdor wears golden armour which could be referred to as yellow I suppose, 
but so does Rogel Dawn. Could it be that after the conclusion of the scouring, both Constantine and Rogel were unhappy with the religious fanaticism infecting the Imperium, and so chose to seclude themselves away to work on a project that would return humanity to the Imperial truth, rather than the teachings of the Ecclesiarchy? After all, Rogel Dawn's traitorous brother, Lorgar, was responsible for penning the Lactitio Divinitatis to begin with. The stage has been set during the Siege of Terror for a great many reader to become emotionally invested in Rogel Dawn's story arc. Could this be setting the stage for his ultimate return in the era Indomitus? After all, who better to fortify the Segmentum Solar against the enroaching Tyranid hordes or malefic forces of the ruinous powers than the person who's done it all before? Corvus Corax. Within the era Indomitus, it has been some 10 millennia since the treachery on Isfain 5, where Corvus Korax's execution of Lorgar was prevented by their mutual brother, Conrad Kurz. Not long after the successful defense of Terra, Korax departs his legion, and it seems the material plane altogether, venturing into the warp to hunt down his treacherous brothers. Of all the loyal Primarchs, it is perhaps Korax who is most suited to this task. Whilst a legion, chapter, company, or even a lone task force of Astartes could no doubt be noticed by the many denizens within the eye, a lone operative has a better chance at achieving stealth. Within the short story, Shadow of the Past, we get our first glimpse of Corvus Corax making good on his promise to bring his brothers to justice. Interestingly, the novel detailing Corvus' exploits post-heresy was released just over a year after we discovered his brother Rebute would be returning to the 40k setting. I'm sure this probably led to some excitement that fans may see Corvus Corax as the next Primarch released. With the galaxy now split in two, Chaos forces run rampant across much of the Imperium Nihilus, but perhaps something dark and dangerous has pursued them out into the material plane. Ultimately, I do not believe we are going to see Corvus returned until the story arc is more in favour of detailing the exploits of Lorgar and his legion. This would be an excellent time for Games Workshop and Black Library both to release more detailed lore and model ranges for both of these often overlooked factions. The Raven Guard and Wordbearers both have a massive opportunity to evolve detailed, unique lore from the last 10,000 years into the current setting, and I doubt Games Workshop will miss the opportunity to dive into both in more detail once they are ready. I know there are many Raven Guard fans out there though, so tell me what you think in the comments. Given we've already seen Corvus Corax active, do you think he'll be the next Loyalist Primarch to return? Lehman Russ Lehman Russ would depart Fenris after the conclusion of the Heresy with only his closest and most trusted bodyguard other than beyond the Fell Handed, that is. Unflinchingly loyal to his father, the Emperor, Lehman Russ was said to have experienced a vision or prophetic moment prior to his disappearance. Could it be that having ruminated on his next course of action for long enough, the notoriously boisterous and independent Primarch would decide to set forth on his own quest to restore his father to full health? Or perhaps, as has occurred in the most up-to-date lore within the era Indomitus, could the Emperor have shared a vision with Lehman Russ? Another piece of the puzzle, in the Emperor's seemingly millennia-spanning plan, to rebuild the Imperium and strike back at the Gods of Chaos. Lehman Russ' quest for the Tree of Life is the most often referred to tale as explanation for his disappearance, though could there be more to Lehman's disappearance than this one mission? Considering Lehman was attending a feast with his chapter before experiencing this vision, then making the seemingly spontaneous decision to depart with only a small amount of his veterans, the tale of the Emperor issuing a quest for him to me rings true. Again, with recent lore detailing Cypher's seeming intent to kill the Emperor, assumingly to revive him, perhaps the Emperor has been hedging his bets and enacted several ways to bring to fruition his apotheosis or revival. What is curious about Lehman Russ is that he swore he would return to his chapter for the final battle which he called the Wolf Time. Could this Wolf Time be the same battle referenced within ancient Aldari legends called the Rana Dandra? in which all the Phoenix Lords reunite for the last battle against Chaos. Could the return of the Space Wolf's 13th Company be a precursor to the return of their Lord? 
It is also said that the king of all Fenris communicates to his sons from beyond, leading them to intervene fortuitously within fated battles, discover dire Xenos threats to expunge, or uncover one of his lost relics. These references to the end times and final battles could very well be leading to a hard reset of the 41st millennium. The Cicatrix Maledictum has torn a gaping hole through which chaos has spilled forth into the material plane. Should Lehman Rust still travel the void within warp space, there is little barring his way to limit a return back to the Imperium of Man, or at least Imperium Nihilus. There are those within the community who believe Rust will be the next Loyalist Primarch to return to the setting. Though it doesn't quite seem like the last round has arrived in the form of the Wolf Time to me. Jagatai Khan Perhaps the wisest and arguably the most independent of all Primarchs, the foresight and ability of Jagatai Khan would well offset the level-headed precision of his brother Rebute, were he to make a return to the current setting. Alas, the last we ever saw of Jagatai, he had assembled a formidable strike force of his white scars to pursue loathsome Drakari into the webway, intent on rescuing the imperial citizens of his homeworld they'd so ruthlessly culled. A master duelist with a confirmed Primarch kill in none other than the Plague Lord himself, Mortarian, the Khan of Khans leading advanced forays from Imperium Secundus into Nihilus, would surely keep the forces of the Despoiler on their toes, or rather the back foot as it were. Now the Cicatrix Maledictum has split the galaxy in two, it is said the White Scars Chakora system within the Yasan sector is one of the last remaining Imperial Bastions before a consolidated, aggressive expansion made by none other than Huron Blackheart's Red Corsairs within that area of space. If the Khan was furious following the raids by the Drakari prior to his departure, he would be inconsolable should he return to find his home world under threat by the traitorous forces of the Red Corsairs. Jagatai's tale of willful disappearance is a lot more open-ended than many of his brothers. For a Primarch and a force of Space Marines, no doubt veterans at that point in the timeline, to disappear whilst pursuing a Drakari raiding party seems a very strange and unlikely, were the tale really that simple. Of course, the Imperium had faced numerous Xenos threats prior to the Horus Heresy, with Jagatai being well versed in combat against this particular species. So why would he not return? It could be that, once in the webway, the White Scars found themselves disoriented. That is easy to do without guides, such as we see with Rebute and his force being led by Harlequins during the Dark Imperium novels following his reawakening. Another possibility, and one that has been mentioned within the global community previously, is that the Primarch of the Fifth Legion may have been captured and enslaved by the very force he pursued into the webway leading to him becoming either a captive or even used as entertainment within Comora's gladiator pits. One last possibility, and not one I've seen before, is that being trapped within the webway for so long may have actually corrupted Jagatai. To prevent Primark returns becoming stale over the years, could it be possible that Games Workshop may elect to corrupt one or more of the Loyalists before reintroducing them to the setting? As I've mentioned, with the Cicatrix Maledictum now opened, merging warp and real space, it is easier than ever for the lost Primarchs to make their way to an Imperial controlled world or void station. So there are many ways Jagatai could plausibly be reintroduced where he simply lost in the webway. Were he to actually be held captive currently by the Drakari, he would need to either set about an escape or a rescue and extraction would need to be enacted. Could the leader of the Inari faction, Ivrain, perhaps hold some sway over this, and even mention to her imperial counterparts tales of one of the Emperor's sons locked within Comora. Invasions into that dark realm have been attempted by both Imperial and Chaos forces before, though they rarely end well for the attacker. The narrative within the Siege of Terror novels does well to warm Jagatai to the fanbase, and I personally do sense a lot more engagement within the community for Jagatai and the White Scars compared to previous years where they were quite an obscure legion. Could Games Workshop be setting the stage for a Jagatai return? Will the Drakari take advantage of the Warp Rift to launch fresh, large-scale raids into the Material Plane, bringing with them news of a giant in white armour kept prisoner within their dungeons? Only time will tell, but what are your thoughts on where Jagatai is? I'd love to learn your opinion.
Vulcan. Both a masterful blacksmith and powerful combatant, the massive, formidable bulk of Vulcan is offset by his sincere, caring nature. Vulcan, like his brothers, would disappear sometime after the Horus Heresy, content his powerful talisman weapons had been kept out of the hands of the traitor legions. Unlike his loyalist Primarch brothers, however, Vulcan would be located in M32 during the galaxy-spanning conflict known as the War of the Beast. Vulcan, along with Corlant, the last surviving Imperial Fist within the entire Imperium, would plan and execute an Imperial campaign to hit back at the Orc Empire, which had rebuilt in secret upon the planet Ulanor, known to the 40k fans as Armageddon. One important point to note about this though, is that Vulcan had to be convinced to join the Imperium in their cause to fight against the Beast. He was not on a pro-Imperium crusade against evil, it isn't actually stated why he'd gone to ground following the heresy. Sadly, Vulcan would again disappear during this conflict, appearing to die alongside the Beast when he detonated a power generator the blast encompassing them both. Soon afterwards, however, we learn the beast survived this explosion, and given that Vulcan is a perpetual, and so will simply be revived after perishing, we can safely assume he is still alive, perhaps biding his time as he did between the time of the scouring and the War of the Beast. It is also said that Vulcan will only return to again lead his chapter once his gene sons have located all nine of the relics he hid prior to his first departure. Given the salamanders have so far located the majority of these, and only have four more relics to locate, perhaps the salamanders will soon be reunited with their Primarch. I know the salamanders have a very dedicated fan base all around the world, more or less being the good space marines if such a thing can be said for the grimdark future. To you guys, do you believe Vulcan's relics must all be located before he returns? And what are some of the fan theories you've seen kicking around regarding his return? Sanguinius Beloved by all, Sanguinius gave the ultimate sacrifice during the conclusion of the Siege of Terror. Owing to his angelic visage, as well as the legendary acts the angel would carry out whilst mounting an imperial defence against the traitor forces during the siege, his name is held in the highest admiration from one side of the galaxy to the other. Unfortunately for Sanguinius, given the prolific nature of his sacrifice, his death has all but been cemented in the history of 40k. Believe it or not though, there may actually be some recent developments within the lore to hint at his return, or at least begin to pave the way. Firstly, and perhaps the most obvious point people will be aware of, is that Sanguinius is said to have communicated with Dante whilst the latter was on the brink of death in the novel Devastation of Baal. It would seem that, similar to Lehman Russ, Sanguinius is choosing now to communicate with his sons. With the amount of historical events and tumult within the Imperium, is some fated event fast approaching that will see the mightiest of Imperial heroes return once more? One theory is the Sanguinor itself is a shard of Sanguinius a segment of his spirit acting within the mortal plane. Given the Sanguinor guides Dante through his trials and tribulations to rise from boyhood to Astartes, again this may be Sanguinius communicating with the Blood Angel's chapter master. Bear in mind also, though Sanguinius was struck dead by the arch traitor Horus, his body is kept in stasis by the Blood Angels, completely defiant of the passage of time, and unlike Horus, Sanguinius' soul was not obliterated. Now, I have to give somebody else credit for this next bit, a YouTube channel called Rusk 40 k which I will link in the description for those who'd like to listen to his full video. Personally, I found it quite impressive how he pieced together the points he goes into within his video. He's a newer channel, so it's always great to show content creators some love. Make sure you give him a look up and check out his full video, you won't regret it. Just to summarise one portion of his video, which he has explained is from the new novel Lion Son of the Forest, he states that the lion is shown a vision by the Emperor which includes a spear and a chalice, and when the lion does not understand what the Emperor is trying to show him, his father becomes visibly upset and ends the vision. As stated by Razak 40 k could this be the Emperor trying to instruct the lion to revive Sanguinius? 
He states the Emperor cannot communicate well, with the powers of chaos limiting the Emperor's actions, so he cannot just speak freely. Personally, if Sanguinius were to be revived, I cannot think of a traitor Primarch, demon or no, that could truly stand against him in combat. An issue for the forces of the Imperium though, and more so Rebute and the Lion, is that were Sanguinius to be revived, his angelic appearance would all but strengthen the god worship of the Emperor of Mankind. It would be extremely difficult to reintroduce atheistic mindsets when your brother is an angel. Given this is the latest novel concerning Primarchs as we head into 10th edition, I for one am looking forward to see how this narrative advances. Ferris Menace. Okay look, bear with me on this one. I believe it is unlikely the Gorgon will return to the setting. If he were to be miraculously revived, this would remove the stakes from the outset of the Horus Heresy almost completely. The shocking death of a Primarch by his brother's hair nonetheless really sets the tone for the ensuing betrayals and civil war. That's not to say Games Workshop wouldn't flesh out his lore. It's said that Ferris Manus was beloved by all his brothers and was a strategist on par with Horus, so there is a lot of material there to expand upon. The reason we don't witness much of this in the Heresy novels is because it occurred very early on in the timeline, well before the events of the first novel, as he was the fourth Primarch discovered, only after Horus, Lehman Russ, and one of the missing Primarchs. As such, Ferris Manus was trusted with one of the Emperor's main crusade fleets and spheres of expansion very early on, winning many great and notable victories for humankind. If Black Library were to ever pen a prequel to the Heresy, such as the unification of Terra and Early Crusade, then that would be an excellent opportunity to endear Ferris to the fanbase more, further enforcing the tragedy of his death at the hands of Fulgrim, maybe even further dropping some lore tidbits on missing Primarchs and the war against the Rangdon, hey? But don't let my negative opinion influence you completely. When the Emperor leads his armies against the demonic incursion in the webway during the novel The Master of Mankind, we do witness a flaming avatar of Ferris Manus within the vengeful Imperial Spirit Host summoned by the Emperor to fight the waves of demons. There is a degree of consternation, whether the spirits raised were in fact the souls of the dead themselves, or whether they were simply effigies conjured forth by the Emperor by his psychic will within the webway, but either way, the door has been left ajar, and Ferris may well walk through it one day. With the current rate of Primarch releases, perhaps when our grandkids are kicking around. Recently, Abaddon the Despoiler has had his already formidable might offset by the arcs of Omen Void Fortresses, gifted to him by the unholy demigod Vashtor, affording further flexibility to the War Master of Chaos. The raw power, let alone transport capacity, of these massive craft make a mockery of most Voidcraft the Imperium could muster to halt an insurgency by a united Black Legion. We have so far witnessed the return of two Primarchs. The revival of Rebute, compared to the current tale of the Lion, was a very straightforward affair. It could be so because it was a momentous occasion within the lore at that point, and the lore that the Ultrarine's Primarch was awaiting such a feat, ready in stasis, had been set in stone for decades of our time. The Lion's return has been somewhat more complicated than I believe most people would have assumed it would play out to be, especially considering we have known the Lion's whereabouts for as long as we've known that of Rebute's. Not only has he not united with his brother Rebute, the Lion has also aged significantly. One of the current novels within Black Library, such as Dan Abnett's Black Legion or Beckwin series, could lay the foundation for a return of Dawn, or even Gav Thorpe's short story Shadow of the Past, doing the same to set up a return for Corvus Corax. Equally, the formation of the Cicatrix Maledictum allows a more easy and plausible return for the likes of Lehman Russ or Jagatai, given they both were thought to be within the eye. Personally, I believe the most fitting loyalist Primarch to return would be the Praetorian himself, Rogel Dawn. Why do I think this? Well, it's not because he's my favourite loyalist Primarch, which he definitely is, long live the Executionist chapter in Fafnir Run, but because the current narrative within 40k sets an extremely bleak outlook for the future of humanity. I've delved into it within our video, Will Games Workshop Kill the Emperor? But basically, I feel we're fast arriving to a point in the storyline 
wherein either everything is going to be super overpowered or something is going to have to give, though this isn't the video to dive further down that rabbit hole. With all the threats facing the Imperium of Man, I believe the best addition or skill set to add to the two Primarchs which have returned would be Rogel Dawns. He is a master strategist and would single-mindedly conduct a bloody campaign of retribution across the galaxy, fortifying worlds and laying low Xenos and traitor fortresses that would make Rabute's Indomitus Crusade look like child's play. Rogel Dawn may not be the hero some Imperium fans want right now, but is the hero they need. Thank you so much for watching, I appreciate the support and love for the channel. Don't forget to leave your opinion and thoughts in the comments section or the discord, I reply to all comments and really enjoy catching up with you guys. If you do want to support the channel, please check out the link in the description to Gap Games for Australian and New Zealand buyers. That's an excellent way to support the channel as we receive a percentage of the purchase value. Besides that, a like, share, comment and subscribe does wonders to share this video and help it gain traction within the algorithm. Until next week, take it easy and have a good one.